A very warm welcome to Global Healthcast COVID Special, a co-production between Global Health Press and the Coalition for Life Course Immunization, CLCI. This podcast was made possible through an unrestricted grant from Novavax. Our six specials will cover epidemiology and surveillance, long COVID, vaccines and vaccination, and COVID in children. I am Joe Schmidt, and with me throughout the six specials is Professor Catherine Weil Olivier. Hello, Catherine. Hello, both of you. Our topic today is COVID-19 experience in children, and it is our great pleasure and honor that for this topic, we have with us as an expert, Professor Federico Martinon Torres. Hello, Professor Martinon Torres. Hello, nice to be here with you both. Professor Martin Torres is currently consultant in pediatrics and head of translational pediatrics and infectious diseases at the Hospital Clinico Universitario de Santiago in Spain. He completed his medical training at the Hope Children's Hospital of Chicago and also at the Children's Memorial Hospital of Chicago. He has been granted more than 25 prizes and awards for academic achievements, and he has published more than 300 scientific articles. He is directing or involved in 25 ongoing international and multi-center clinical trials and research projects, and he is a collaborator with WHO Europe. Today, we will ask him on experience with COVID in children, and I am allowed to ask the first question. Professor Martin Ontoris, how important is COVID-19 in children as compared to adults? And the main question certainly is, has it been exaggerated? Well, thanks, Joe. I, I wouldn't say it has been exaggerated, but probably overestimated. I mean, we need to take into account that at the beginning, when the pandemic started, we didn't know exactly what to expect about SARS-CoV-2 infection in children. So in many cases, if a positive case uh, appear in a child, we would admit the child to just observe and see what to do just in care. So Initially, when we tried to establish the burden of COVID-19 in children, we took into account those numbers, and the, the, it, 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 we used to say that the, the burden in terms of hospitalization of COVID-19 in children was comparable to that of flu, and that was true in terms of uh, crude numbers. But when we reflect on those initial experiences and learning after with the new variants, uh, there are nice studies showing that many of those cases were not actually admitted because of COVID, and, and, and maybe they were just admitted just in case. There is a nice study from Fixmont showing that uh, analyzing all the children hospitalized due to COVID, and in almost 60% of these patients, the finding of SARS-CoV-2 was just incidental, and in only 10% of these patients, SARS-CoV-2 was the actual cause for the admission. So I'm not telling that there is no burden, but indeed it's not as important as we initially could imagine, and of course, is less important than the burden uh, COVID-19 has in the adult population or in any patient with high risk uh, factors. So I understand that in a whole population, COVID in children was not so frequent. Nevertheless, it could be severe. And I know you have a lot of experience about uh, childhood multisystem inflammatory syndrome. Could you tell a bit more about uh, that, please? Yes, indeed, uh, Catherine. I think that the, the, we were all really scared when the first cases of MIS-C, as it is called, or at, at that moment was called Kawasaki-like or PINS or many other acronyms to describe uh, severe cases of uh, multisystemic inflammation in children near after or a few weeks after the initial exposure to SARS-CoV-2, not necessarily severe SARS-CoV-2, but uh, cases that resemble uh, the Kawasaki syndrome, but with more severe cardiovascular and, uh, involvement, no? and with a significant mortality reaching up to 4% mortality in the initial, in the initial uh, 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 report. So indeed, uh, MIS-C, this childhood multisystemic inflammatory syndrome, uh, made us uh, feel fear as pediatricians for the first time regarding COVID-19 uh, in, in our uh, caring population. The good news is that now we know better the syndrome, we have understood better uh, how is developed. We uh, have described different subphenotypes. We know how to treat it. So the, the, the picture has completely changed. So I'm not telling this is not important, but it's not as important as it used to be because also 
the incidence of uh, mean C has decreased spontaneously. We don't know exactly which is the mechanism behind, but we are seeing no more the amount of cases we used to see at the beginning when this uh, uh, this uh, uh, picture appear on, on our pediatric population. So indeed, we can see severe cases in pediatric uh, population, but the mortality rate in children of COVID is below two cases per million uh, uh, infections. And of course, uh, it is uh, not zero, but it's not comparable to that of adults. And importantly, most of the cases, three out of four uh, uh, fatality cases occurring in children, occur in otherwise uh, children with existing comorbidities or high risk factors for uh, SARS-CoV uh, severity. That brings me then to the question, uh, you know, we, now we know there is a difference and there is some severe pediatric COVID-19. So the question then is, why is COVID severity different in children compared to adults? Well, I think we have been struggling with that from the beginning and we have several hypotheses. I don't know if we have for sure, which is the reason or the only reason, and maybe it's the combination of different factors. Indeed, the strong immune system of the infants, particularly the innate, innate immune response, can, can be blamed for part of this success uh, when dealing with the virus uh, of children as compared to, to adults, but also other uh, factors like the density and, and ubication of the AC2 receptors where the, the virus attached to the host which is different in children, and these receptor differences can explain a, a different pathogenesis. It has been also alluded the possibility that cross-protection coming from the other routine vaccines could influence this better response. And I think one of the most interesting and for which we have more evidence is the possibility of cross-protection coming from the exposure of children to the other seasonal coronaviruses that we know they can affect children and they have a less severe course, but this uh, uh, protection can be uh, uh, protective or partially protected against SARS-CoV-2. And also, it, and I think it's interesting, the so-called nasal magic on children, you know, the flexibility on the nasal mucosa to defend to pathogens as compared to others. So all that together with another important fact, and is that children usually are healthy, less have less comorbidities, have a healthy endothelium, could explain the different severity of SARS-CoV-2 in children as compared to adults. And last, what about any long-term effect? What we what was called long COVID, quite frequent in adults over three months having some symptoms. And there seems to be a large difference in children. Yeah, well, as you know, for sure, long COVID in children is different as compared to adults. And I think, of course, it exists, but it's rare as compared to adults and mainly of short duration. As it happens with the adults at the beginning, there was a lot of noise, which makes difficult to measure the true burden of uh, of long COVID even in the adult population. And the the most accurate and most, let's say, comprehensive studies performed in the pediatric population tell us that Yes, indeed, there are symptoms after COVID. And when you look at big cohorts comparing uh, big, uh, well-controlled cohorts, there are obvious difference in percentual change from, and from the statistical significance in the presence of persistent symptoms, but it's in a very low number of cases. Some of the series tell us that can grow from 0% to 70%. So this is a too wide <clears throat> range. So if you look, to the more reliable studies, what you find is that when you do th different time points measurements, and I like one study particularly from Pinto Pereira, where they look at patients hospitalized with COVID and without COVID, and they follow up them not only at baseline after discharge, but at six months and 12 months, and they see that there are difference, but not that big, and that by 12 months are resolved in the vast majority, if not all of the cases in young children and adolescents. So yes, Long COVID exists in children, but I don't think it has the importance uh, as it has been uh, detected in uh, the other population. Mm -hmm. So to summarize, we have less and less severe COVID in children, but there is severe COVID in some children and some risk children. We have this multi-system inflammatory syndrome. We do have long COVID at a lower rate than in adults. 
Now let's switch a little bit to vaccines. And now if children are different from adults, how are the adverse events of COVID-19 vaccines in children compared to the adult population? Well, that's a good question. The good news is that we can tell, we can assure now that COVID vaccines are also efficacious in children. And this is for a fact. We have the clinical trials that were performed and also we have uh, real-life data uh, re reassuring no, the, the, the data from the trials. Our group, for example, recently published in JICI uh, the results of the effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccines in our region in, in Galicia in 5 to 12 years old and, and, and 12 to 18 years old children. And the efficacy was, uh, and the, effect, the effectiveness in this case, because it was real life efficacy, was outstanding and comparable to those, to that of adults, particularly in the older children, probably lower in the group from five to 12. But indeed, the limitation is the duration of that protection, and, and particularly with the new variants. And we see that actually the vaccines are protected, but this protective effect, it's, uh, let's say, uh, uh, limited in time. No? So we can state they are safe and, and that they work, but they have limitations, particularly in the duration this protection uh, can last. Would you give us some details about uh, safety, what has been described, especially in adolescents and young adults, please? Yeah, well, I agree that, that, that we need efficacious vaccines, but also they have, they must be safe. And a lot of sayings and noise have been performed around uh, safety of COVID vaccines in general, and particularly in the pediatric population. I think we can be also certain that COVID-19 vaccines, the available COVID-19 vaccines are safe in children also. It's true that they, are, they can uh, generate some serious health uh, events after vaccination, but these are rare. The most frequently reported, and it was like a worldwide alarm, was the, the onset of myocarditis, the inflammation of the heart muscle, and the pericarditis, the inflammation of the outer lining of, of the heart, that was reported in children and, and teenagers after vaccination, particularly in males, and particularly after the second dose when using uh, mRNA-based vaccines. But after long-term follow-up, we can say this is extremely rare in the group 5 to 11 years, uh, with data coming from the CDC, for example, where only 20 confirmed reports of myocarditis after 18 million doses in the group 5 to 11 have been found. And if we look at the global picture, we could expect around 70 cases per million doses in males from 12 to 15 years of age. So yes, like any vaccine, what we can expect is the usual reactogenicity and some rare events of serious adverse events that also can be further uh, reduce when you uh, increase the interval between doses. So I think that we can state that these vaccines are also safe in children. Now, uh, with all that in mind, uh, the, um, okay, vaccines are safe and efficacious, but at the same time, disease is mild, although there are, particularly in risk children, more severe causes as well. So is there a need to vaccinate children against COVID-19? And what would be the argument to um, to vaccinate children? Well, thanks, Joe, for bringing the elephant into the room. No, I think it's it's a question that has different answers depending on the moment of the pandemic. We now know more the virus has evolved. We have better treatments, better systems of detection. So it can explain why the actual recommendations have changed over time and they are still different depending on the different countries. So clearly from the beginning, the priority to vaccinate children was different as compared to adults, you know, because we already knew that the, 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 the importance, the burden as we have previously discussed was different in children as compared to, to adults. That's a fact. That, but also we knew from the beginning that irrespective of age, if you had risk factors, your probability to have a severe COVID is high and it doesn't have to be exactly with age. As a matter of fact, three out of each four deaths in children due to COVID occur in children with pre-existing condition or risk factors uh, to COVID. So I think there is a global agreement that any child with a risk factor or a comorbid condition predisposing to severe COVID-19 should be vaccinated. I think that's out of the, of the debate. Another story is what to do with the 
uh, universal vaccination of otherwise healthy children. And then here, I think that for sure, we can say that it's safe, as we have already mentioned, that it's efficacious, and we need to consider if it is efficient and if it is from a public health perspective a priority as compared to other age groups with regards to COVID-19, but I would add to other vaccines that should be used in the pediatric age population. So I think that it's important to follow whatever the recommendation of the country we are living, that's a fact, but indeed the vaccination of healthy children is less prioritary than the vaccination of uh, other uh, age groups and uh, probably less priority uh, than other vaccines that are not yet included in many of the countries that are using or considering using universal COVID-19 pediatric vaccination. So uh, we understand perfectly your position. Could you please detail a bit who is at risk? in the children population? Well, as you well know, Catherine, it's less clear than in the adult population, although some of the risk factors that have been well stated for the adult population are similar in the pediatric population, namely type 1 diabetes, cardiac and cardiocirculatory uh, anormalities, uh, preterm birth, and also most common conditions like asthma, uh, depression, obesity. And I would add to this a very specific one for the pediatric population, which is the uh, chronic pluripathology, you know, children with syndromic or acquire multiple uh, morbidities, uh, adding also uh, neurological impairment that are at a higher risk of COVID-19. So in practice, I would say that we need to cover these groups and probably in any case of doubt, I mean, if I'm not sure, uh, about if this patient or this child has or not a condition in the list, I would vaccinate them. So for me, that's clear. And I would say that is a, all the supranational regulatory agencies agree on that. Uh, the specificity is the list and the degree of evidence supporting each of the risk factors may be different to the other population. So I would be flexible in that regard. Would you say that uh, the risk factors for COVID are similar to the risk factors for influenza and have well, a similar list country by country? Yeah, I think that's a, a, a very practical way of looking at that. No, I think that uh, we have seen that in general, <clears throat> influenza, RSV and, and, and COVID-19 in the adult population attack the same uh, the same uh, vulnerable uh, targets, no? So I think that it's a good practice rule and I agree with you uh, uh, and I think it's, it's a good advice. I, I have a challenge for you. Um, so my uh, grandson is now six months, I guess, should he be vaccinated before going to kinder care, to, to kindergarten, to crash to, to an institution with the goal to protect people working there? Okay, that's a, a good question, <laughs> Joe. So, from uh, we should differentiate what's the official recommendation on, and what's my personal view, and we should differentiate also what's the individual perspective and the public health perspective. So, for sure, if you vaccinate your grandchild from an individual perspective, it's safe, it's efficacious, and you are uh, avoiding him, even if it is a low risk, that risk of a severe uh, COVID-19. So that's a fact. Uh, from a public health perspective, should we uh, keep vaccinating universally children, healthy children against COVID? Then it's another story because other factors come into the discussion. No, the cost that comes from that, the need of repeated booster to sustain that protection, if that is affordable and efficient for the specific uh, country, and again, not to lose the perspective on other priorities in terms of vaccination for that same population. So I think there is no harm in vaccinating children against COVID, but I, uh, healthy children, I mean, but I think that is not a priority at this moment with the current Omicron and uh, Omicron subvariants and in the current context. This can change as the virus can evolve, but at this moment, I don't think that's a priority. Very good. I think I have no more questions. I'm looking at Catherine, if you yeah, are satisfied with all you heard. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Martin on Torres. Uh, this was our Global Healthcast COVID-9 special on vaccines and vaccination in children with Professor Torres from Spain. Today, uh, it was a great pleasure again uh, to have you with us. 
Please like, share and leave your comments below. Thanks for joining us today. Stay safe and get your vaccines. I am Joe Schmidt. I am Catherine Veille-Olivier. And I'm Federico Martinon. Thanks for inviting me and listening.